Hey there, John McWhorter. How you doing? Hey, Glenn Lowry. How are you? I'm doing well, doing well. Welcome to the Glenn Show, my regular uh, conversational partner. Uh, Honored to be here. Good to have and, you back, man. Yeah, so today, um, I think rather obviously the topic of the week is Mr. Trayvon Martin. Trayvon Martin, the young man, 17-year-old African-American teenager, unarmed, gunned down, uh, in a gated community in uh, Florida, Sanford, Florida, and has become a cause celeb. Uh, John, what, what do you have to say about that? I think this is very, very important. And it's because I honestly believe that the main thing that keeps us in this country from getting past race in any meaningful way is not statistics like the fact that black couples get slightly less cushy car deals than white couples and things like that. I think it's the relationship between particularly black men and the police. If you ask a person why they think racism is still what America is all about, what being black is all about, all you have to do is count the seconds before they start talking about the police, and it's because it's a real problem. And this is a case where as much of a tragedy as that boy's death was, it can do some benefit to the country if what that case attracts is a sustained and conclusive attention to the fact that we cannot tolerate a situation where black men have to fear for their lives or just vicious invasions of their privacy, whereas other men and other people do not nearly as much. What do you think? Well, I agree with everything you said, of course. Uh, I think this uh, particular incident is a, a tragedy beyond imagining for the family involved, for the young man who lost his life. Uh, it is an outrage uh, that, um, as you put it, uh, an African-American man has to fear for his life under circumstances of the kind in which Trayvon Martin lost his. Uh, I think that you might overstate it slightly to say that the whole race question is driven by this kind of interaction between African-American men and the police, but it is certainly a big part of it. I think, you know, there are a number of different things going on here. There's the stereotyping, which leads observers to impute suspicious and nefarious motive and intent on the basis of skin color, gender, age, and circumstance. There is the um, vigilante-fueled sentiment that has private citizens armed with 9 millimeter automatic weapons on the prowl for, quote, bad guys, close quote, whom they're going to, you know, protect the rest of us from. There's the legal environment that, um, you know, uh, this uh, stand your ground law in Florida, which has its defenders and which can be debated but which nevertheless does send a message that, uh, you know, you, the decent law-abiding citizen, have had it up to here with these scumbag punks who've been pushing us around, and darn it, every one of us is a potential hero, every one of us is a potential dirty hairy, go ahead, punk, make my day, uh, peacekeeping, um, you know, uh, security officer. Uh, so mm -hmm. there's this, this kind of attitude. And then there is the reaction, and I think this is one of the most important uh, aspects of this case, that it is catalytic, it seems, in triggering uh, what has been a, you know, the release of what is kind of a pent-up tension in certain parts of our polity, the African-American and Latino communities, progressive whites and all of that, against heavy-handed policing, against, uh, you know, one more time the, um, the uh, instruments of law have, you know, uh, come down uh, way too hard on, on innocent persons, in part because of their race. So it's a bundle of stuff like that in my mind, but yeah. Yeah, it's, um, it, it, it's something that comes up again and again, and I think that a lot of people outside of the black community don't understand how central it is. And what I mean by saying that the police is central to conceptions of how important racism is. It's not that it's the only racism, but I think that it is the one kind that is so immediate and so persistent that it creates a whole mindset. And I, I always come at this with sort of one foot in and one foot out. Probably the very beginning of me feeling at all like 
a race man was 20 plus years ago after Rodney King. And to me, what happened with Rodney King was a one-time occurrence, and suddenly I'm noticing people marching in the streets and breaking windows, and I genuinely didn't quite understand the size of the response compared to what had happened, and talked to a lot of people, and actually read the issue of the nation at that time that explored what the roots of black rage were. I really wanted to know, and what I found was there was this pent-up anger at the police. And because I grew up middle class in a very quiet neighborhood, it isn't something that ever touched me. So it wasn't something immediate. But that's really there. And we've seen it again with Amadou Diallo. That was now a long time ago. This is another example. And I think that in this case, it's particularly important because there are no mitigating circumstances. And so, for example, here in New York, Sean Bell, who was 23 or 24, was shot dead in 2006. And the problem was that he shouldn't have been killed. It was a tragedy. But he was in an argument late night at a club, and there had been talk of a fight, and the people who shot him thought that they had heard one of his friends saying that they had a gun. And Ramali Graham is an 18-year-old who just in February was shot by the police. They were chasing him. And it turned out that he did have marijuana on him. He flushed it down the toilet as he locked himself in a bathroom. That doesn't mean that he remotely deserved to be killed or hurt. But there are always these circumstances where you think, well, the person got caught in a situation that they shouldn't have gotten caught in, and that ended up creating a spiral. Here, there was no spiral. This poor guy just was carrying Skittles and iced tea and ends up being shot dead by somebody who clearly has an issue with young black men and was hopped up and waiting to grab one. I haven't written about this, but I'll just bet you know, he has the hoodie on. I'll bet he had a kind of a loping walk that a lot of young black men have. And this idiot in a car interprets him as a hoodlum rather than just as a young black man thinks that he's wandering rather than just walking the way young black men have walked since about 1985, and he gets killed. Okay, it just John. won't do. Yeah, well, no, of course it won't do. Um, there are never any extenuating circumstances uh, sufficient to justify someone losing their life because they have a bag of marijuana, though I take your point. This kid, Trayvon Martin, is a poster child. You know, he is... He's young, he's uh, slightly built, he's uh, clean, he's of no nefarious purpose. There's no, you know, he should not have been even uh, approached, uh, let alone harmed in any way. So mm -hmm. if you want to be against stop and frisk, if you want to be against citizen vigilantism, if you want to be against uh, police uh, brutality and excess, he's a poster child case, no doubt about it. But that kid in New York City, who was followed by undercover police officers on a narcotics beat because they had observed him purchase marijuana, followed mm -hmm. into his home, had his door kicked in, and then because they, f they falsely and inaccurately presumed that he was armed, was shot right. to death while he was dumping a bag of marijuana down the toilet? Right. There, there, there is no circumstance, and I don't care if he had marijuana or not, I don't care whether marijuana is uh, legal or illegal or not, he's not supposed to lose his life at the hands no. of the duly constituted civil authority because of that. No. So anyway, I'm, I'm sure we, we both agree about that. But I think there's something else that, you know, we have to deal with here, which is that the violent crime problem in inner city black and brown communities is a really serious problem, adversely affecting mostly black and brown people. And while, if it needs saying, the existence of violent crime in these communities gives no cover to Mr. Zimmerman, the shooter in the Trayvon Martin case, mm -hmm. and, in, and in any event could never legitimate or authorize uh, police brutality and the kind of... Uh, you know, irresponsible use of uh, lethal force, as was the case in that New York City case that you referred to. Nevertheless, the existence of that problem, I think, does contribute to this um, stereotyping and this um, sort of hair-trigger sensibility uh, that we see in law enforcement uh, and also in, uh, in the private citizenry who are worried about being victimized. Uh, it is a real problem
And if we're going to get out of this um, tough spot that we're in as a country, we have to also talk about how to reduce that problem. I, I think that should be a part of this conversation. Do you agree? Yeah, I very much agree. I mean, right here in New York, um, the police commissioner, Ray Kelly, is saying that we can't stop the stopping and frisking in minority communities because those are the places where there's the most violence. And he's actually throwing down a gauntlet and saying, well, what would you do? You know, how do we stop that? How do we address this violence if we don't canvass the community? And some people would say you're stopping and frisking too much. And I think that most think people right. would agree that that's yeah. happening way, way too much. But still, the little problem, what nobody talks about, is that it would still have to happen much more in those communities than it would on the Upper East Side because there is this issue of the violence and what do you do about it and of course part of it is determining what the violence <coughs> is due to. What do you think the reason is that in one of these communities more people have and use guns than they have and use them on the Upper East Side? It's really that, that question. What would you say? Well, let me come to that and I'm not sure I know the answer to the question of why there's such high degree of variance in the incidence of violence across communities defined by race and ethnicity and social class, but let me come to that. First, I want to just say a word about the stop and frisk thing, because the scale, you know, uh, the police commissioner in New York City says we have a violent crime problem. It's true. In New York City neighborhoods, there is a violent crime problem. He says stop and frisk is instrumental in uh, mitigating that problem, and then he goes on to say, if you want us to not do stop and frisk so much, tell us how to solve the problem. Well, there's a, step, there's a step in that logic that I think requires to be demonstrated, and that is that stop and frisk has caused the reduction in violent crime, which we've observed, because we've observed it not just in New York City. We've observed it across the board in this nation. Violent crime fell off the uh, table uh, in a rapid decline starting in the uh, early 1990s that persists until this day, and that decline in violence is something that you can observe in almost every large American city, regardless of the policing tactics that are used there. So I question the claim that you need to do stop and frisk in order to reduce violence. I'm not sure that anybody understands fully why uh, the U.S. urban society has uh, witnessed the sharp decline in violence that we have um, that we have witnessed. Secondly, the scale of the stop and frisk thing is absolutely mind-boggling, and the uh, unequal application of it is also startling. I mean, we're talking something on the order of three quarter of a million stops in a year by the New York mm -hmm. City Police Department. They mm -hmm. say that they found 6,000 weapons in, you know, 700,000 stops. So 1% of the stops yield weapons. 10% of those weapons are firearms. Most of those weapons are probably knives or some kind of improvised uh, you know, uh, a device that a person might use in order to, uh, to protect themselves or to make themselves more effective in a fight. But um, for that uh, benefit, uh, a huge number of people have been humiliated, inconvenienced, detained, uh, surveilled, and so forth. And moreover, it's vastly more likely that this is going to happen to you. I mean, I think three quarters of the stops are of black and Hispanic men. If you're, mm -hmm. if you're a non-white uh, male. So, I mean, I'm with the people who are in the streets of New York City protesting against stop and frisk. I think the police department is vastly overplaying its hand, and I believe uh, citing violence in minority communities is a justification for racially biased uh, and intrusive uh, uh, policing of this kind is, is, is just a, uh, you know, they're just using it as a cover for something. I'm, I'm not persuaded by that argument. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, why do I think violence is higher? Well, I think violence is higher in lower educated and in lower income uh, uh, communities. I think violence is higher where you have a lot of young men who are raised by women who are not, uh, where there's not a father presence. I think the drug trade facilitates violence, I think, where it's easy uh, to get weapons uh, and where they're widely held, that will uh, be a promoter of violence. I think that if I live in an environment where I think a lot of people are armed and dangerous, I may well choose to be armed. Whereas if I, if I live in an environment where I think it's relatively safe, I may not, which allows for the possibility of hot spots, that is, you know, areas in which because everybody assumes that everybody else is carrying, 
Everybody carries. Everybody carries, and that's an equilibrium. Right. That's a self-sustaining circumstance. Exactly. And uh, those are more likely to be housing projects, uh, the no-go zones, and the more or less abandoned parts of the city, the places where there's a lot of illicit uh, activity going on and a lot of bad uh, actors to be encountered. Uh, I think you might argue that there are some cultural aspects to, I think gang activity is probably going to be positively associated with this kind of thing. I think cycles of vengeance in which uh, people are retaliating over uh, the fact that a previous violent incident has occurred can generate these kind of spirals uh, and so on. I mean, and perhaps there are other factors of which I am not aware. Uh, but sure, th there is a big difference across these communities. But, but does that justify the routine adoption of a kind of posture of suspicion and belligerence vis-a-vis -a, -vis a whole class of people? We're talking about tens of millions of people here who are male uh, and are uh, black or brown and uh, maybe, maybe wearing a hoodie. You know, I, I don't think it does. And I think we really have to push back against you know, not just the specific act, but also the climate of perception and opinion that has fostered this act. Yep, I agree with everything you're saying, although I should say devil's advocate, and I can't yeah. recall who wrote this study, but I, I guess I have to shill for my former employers, the Manhattan Institute. There was a responsible study done that showed that crime in New York over a lengthy period, I forget exactly which one, has gone down as the result of efforts here along the lines of what was inspired by the late James Q. Wilson's Broken Windows philosophy and the CompStat police program, independently of the drop in crime around the rest of the country. It's this kind of data that somebody like Ray Kelly will refer to in a press conference. I wish I could remember who did the study, but I don't right now, but it would be available on the Manhattan Institute's website. None of which is to justify the stop and frisk regime in the city. There clearly has to be a different way, because with what's going on now, not only is it a rank injustice to an entire group of people, but it just keeps alive a kind of general animus against society among the whole population, which is constructive neither for them nor for anyone else. So obviously there must, there has to be another way. And it does lead to a question. And I don't want to jump on my hobby horse about the war on drugs again, but I do believe that when it comes to guns in inner city communities, a lot of it has to do with policing turf, because you notice that if you read an ethnography of a black ghetto in as I've done. early, early, what? I said, as I have done. Yes. Then you notice that what people are complaining <laughs> about are all sorts of familiar things. But in terms of violence, what everybody mentions is knives. You hear knives clicking, not guns. You know, though even a black inner city or housing project wasn't full of people shooting each other 40 and 50 years ago. And there seems to be a connection with the drug war. But it's interesting, there isn't much data on something that you'd think there would be data about, which is how many people who are in prison for a long time are there, if not technically on a drug charge, and if they're there on a violence charge, was the violence connected to drugs in any way? I've been looking for data on that lately and finding that really most of the evidence on that is anecdotal. And it would be an interesting question. But George Zimmerman, of course, should not have had a gun at all. And that's a problem with Florida in general. He wasn't an inner city hoodlum. He was just a very sick person. But that's clearly part of the conversation. Yeah, let, let me mention two books while I'm thinking of it. One of them is by Bernard Harcourt, H-A-R-C-O-U-R-T, and it's called The Illusion of Order, and it is a systematic dismantling of the kind of claims that this Manhattan Institute study that you call attention to make about, mm -hmm. the, effic about the efficacy of stop and frisk and, and broken windows-inspired policing. So there's mm -hmm. controversy out there. That's all. The okay. only point I'm trying to make... Bernard Harcourt is a professor of political science at the University of Chicago. He's written many other interesting books. He's not an idiot. And there's, right. a, real, there's a real debate about the extent to which that's the case. Okay. The, other book, the other book I want to mention is by William Stuntz, S-T-U-N-T-Z, uh, the late William Stuntz. He just died last year. He was a professor of law at Harvard, and his book is called The Collapse of American Criminal Justice. And... Um, you know, he, he makes this point. He, he says that, you know, uh, 
A lot of the crime is occurring in the inner city, but much of the social response to crime is driven by the sensibility of the suburban resident. The <laughs> suburban resident who is not himself or herself mostly susceptible to criminal offending, but is, you know, made uh, anxious by it, has moved away from the city because of it, regrets what has happened to the old neighborhood where two generations ago their immigrant forebears uh, were able to live decently in which they now see in squalor and so forth and so on. And, and he says that the resulting politics that comes out of that division, where the people who have to deal with the messy reality that many in our society have not been rightly socialized and are in fact antisocial and to some of us dangerous persons, uh, but we also are perhaps related to such people or know them or have them as our neighbors or in our family or whatnot. The people who reside in these communities don't themselves get to make the call about how much risk versus how much security, about uh, how much cost to impose on the innocent bystander versus how tough to be on the people who are really bad actors. They don't get to make that call. That, that call gets made someplace else. It, get made, it gets made by an NRA advocate who says we have to arm ourselves to protect ourselves against them. Or it gets made by, um, you know, a prosecutor or a judge who at the municipal or county level may have to run for election facing um, uh, an electorate that's dominated by suburban voters, even though the actions that they take will mostly be affecting the lives of uh, inner city people. And I guess all I'm trying to say here uh, in invoking Stunts' argument is that agency, I mean, we have a serious problem, a problem with social disorder and violence. How we respond to that is a big question of public policy. And who's going to decide the policy? The people who have to deal mostly with the problem or the people who are safely removed from it and use the, their response to the problem as a sort of venue for their acting out of their symbolic angst or their latent racism or uh, whatever it might be. Uh, so one thing that heartens me in the uh, tragic incidents of Trayvon Martin's death is that uh, people who are the subjects of the stop and frisk policy, I'm talking about African Americans, um, are themselves now empowered to organize, to act out, to demonstrate, to protest, to demand, to insist that the, sense the system be responsive to their needs. And they do it now with a great deal more credibility because of this tragic case. Yeah, I think one wrinkle in the whole thing is that we're talking about stop and frisk, but with George Zimmerman, he was not a policeman. Yeah. And he was not looking for drugs on anybody. It was a rather freakish occurrence in its way. And then you have this stand your guard law, which allows him to claim that he was acting in self-defense, which means that he hasn't been arrested. And so there's a symbolic quality to it all in that ultimately at the end of the day what we're upset about is that this young black boy was killed for nothing when he would not have been if he were a young white boy and there's also something that's only been talked about so much there's an Emmett Till aspect to it in that it was almost going to go unheeded and also that he was away from home and so there's a there's a kind of a, a concurrence of those two cases and I hope, actually, mainly, that this actually leads to something. Amadou Diallo led to something in 1998. Ever since then, all police departments, I think, have been much more sensitized to these kinds of issues, although we're certainly nowhere near perfect yet. Police profiling in the 90s and before was a much more naked problem than it's been since then. But this seems to be a new case. I think that we will be talking about this in a year. I, I agree with you. I think you, I think we will. I'm, I'm really glad you mentioned Emmett Till because I meant to do that myself and forgot about it. And let's just remind the viewers that Emmett Till was the young uh, African American man in the 1950s from Chicago who went south uh, on holiday or to visit family or whatever it was who uh, apparently whistled at or gave some public expression of uh, appreciation of the good looks of a white woman on a dare. Uh, Right. Uh, in a southern town and who was uh, set upon uh, by a racist uh, terrorist, domestic terrorist, who abducted, murdered him, and buried his body. And uh, when, when his remains were found, his mother, uh, upon their return to Chicago, had an open casket funeral for him so that a young man, myself, 
eight or nine years old sitting around Chicago in the 1950s could open up a magazine and see a horrific photograph of the remains. You can still see it online, right. Of the remains of this young man who'd been murdered there. And it became, of course, a cost celeb because this was a lynching in 1950s America. The United States Senate had never passed a federal anti-lynching law, which would have empowered federal law enforcement authorities to investigate cases of this kind, which the local authorities tended not to uh, investigate seriously. Uh, and it was just an awful, awful thing. So here we are now, 50-odd years later, and we have another, I don't know if you want to call this a lynching. I think you might be able to do that without too much abuse of language. We have another case. Uh, that I, I think promises to become a cause celeb in, in the best way uh, of the uh, needless death of a young African American man under these kind of prototypic circumstances of him being innocent but falling under suspicion, overly aggressive law enforcement, or in this case not even law enforcement but volunteer citizen uh, security patrol, and then losing his life. And then there not being, at least not yet, any effective response from law enforcement to the fact that this young man was murdered. So uh, let him become the Emmett Till of the 21st century, and you and I, who are not given to you know excess and vituperation about racial matters, are nevertheless willing to draw that analogy. That's not uh, hyperbole in this case. It's the appropriate association of events in American yeah. history. So yeah, I would I, say. Yeah, I, I would agree, and I actually wrote in the New Republic, and I meant it. That this one is so egregious that if justice is not done, and I would say with all deliberate speed, then for the first time there would be a part of me that would understand people demonstrating in the streets to the point of breaking things and creating disorder. To this day, I think about what happened after Rodney King, and I have to wrap my mind around what would make someone do those things in the wake of that event. I think I understand, but I have to work at it, like trying to grasp the fifth dimension. But in this case, fourth dimension, but in this case, I would understand if people were really, as they always said about Watts, fed up. I, the, the final sentence that I wrote in the New Republic got edited a little bit because I was actually asked, do you really mean this? And I said, yes, I do. <laughs> because it really, it, it's quite appalling. And you know, Glenn, there's another aspect to this. I mean, let's face it, there'll be some sort of movie or certainly earnest black playwrights, young ones, probably with three names. There are going to be a couple of plays about this. <laughs> An interesting thing about it is that Zimmerman is not exactly white. No, I saw that. It's a, Latino part of him, he apparently, quote-unquote, knew a lot of black people. And so this is not some pot-bellied, lily-white, southern person out of the 1950s. This is a modern, muttly American who clearly has the same anti-young black boy bias that you would expect from a very different kind of person, which shows that we are talking about modern America and not an old America, but it's still nasty in the same way. Well, there were non-white police involved in the shooting of Sean Bell as well, and I That's think right. that the point is that if you have an environment of racial stigma and of severe stereotyping adverse to young black men, there's nothing that protects black people from, uh, as it were, drinking that Kool-Aid. But I want to I want to respond to your thing about civil uh, disorder with two observations: the studies of the consequences of the 1960s riots for both the political leverage of African Americans in general and for the socioeconomic well-being of the cities where the riots took place are, I think, unequivocal in reaching the conclusion that it was a bad thing for black people that those riots took place. Mm -hmm. the, the areas of the cities in Detroit, Chicago, Washington, D.C., and all around the country in which there were several discoveries never recovered from it. And moreover, the general political backlash against progressive civil rights and, you know, uh, black-oriented uh, policy, uh, this is harder to pin down statistically, but the circumstantial evidence is pretty strong, suggests that that backlash had a very long shadow. Ten or 15 years after the riots, we were still seeing voters in the 1980 presidential election being influenced in part by their adverse reactions to the disorderly uh, protests of the 1960s. So that's one thing I want to say. The other thing I want to say is that there's an alternative to going into the street and smashing things, and that is changing the laws so that when people are victimized in this way, they're empowered to sue the hell out of the municipality or the residential association or whatever organization is responsible for putting 
wild eyed, hair trigger uh, uh, prone, uh, racist, uh, well armed people uh, on the streets where they can perpetrate the kind of act that Mr. Zimmerman evidently perpetrated. In other words, in other words, if Sanford, Florida, I uh, had to fork over ten million or a hundred million dollars to the estate of Trayvon Martin uh, as a consequence of this uh, uh, horrible deed, mm -hmm. you would find very different policies being enacted, very different training programs and indoctrination programs for uh, security persons, a very different culture in the organizations that are out there uh, which have the ability to do the kind of thing that happened in this Sanford, Florida case. So maybe rather than going into the streets and tearing something down, on second thought, those of us who are deeply exercised about this whole event ought to get smart, get some very good lawyers pro bono from uh, wherever we got to find them, and uh, get into the state legislatures lobbying for stuff and get into the courts and try to shift the legal environment so that there's real liability uh, associated with uh, uh, the uh, perpetrating acts of this kind. So that's my thought. I'd rather sue them than burn them down. Ultimately, so would I.